The following is a Michigan sesquicentennial year presentation. Cottontail rabbits are the bread and butter game animal throughout the United States. They can be hunted alone by hunters walking through fields and woods. But America's favorite dog, the beagle, is the real rabbit specialist. Beagles love to chase rabbits. They do it naturally, and they alone make a rabbit hunt enjoyable. In the northern part of our state, the UP and the northern lower, we have the snowshoe hares. In the southern part, we have cottontail rabbits. That's where we're going to go hunting, so stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. From the rugged shore and woodlands of the north, it's history. Here's America's most popular dog, the Beagle. You can tell by the way it's holding its mouth what song it's singing. Beagles have melodic voices, at least to rabbit hunters. The dogs are as much an attraction to rabbit hunting as those tasty cottontails. Now, you don't train beagles the way you train other dogs. They either run rabbits or they don't. And every beagle seems to have a little different style just like rabbit hunters prefer different guns, different boots, different hats and jackets. Bob Garner enjoys rabbit hunting as much as anybody I know. He likes beagles that move along at a good clip, aggressive beagles. And it goes without saying that Bob likes to eat rabbit. In fact, I don't know a rabbit hunter who doesn't. Greg and Mark from Muskegon both enjoy these afternoon hunts. They live far enough north for both cottontails and snowshoe hares. Now, Mark Martin is most known for his skill at guiding anglers to Lunker Walleye in Muskegon Lake, but he's also attracted to any good patch of rabbit cover. Okay, well, this is about 40 acres of how many brush piles? Uh, there'd be 10, 11 of these great big brush piles from where they cleared it. They just left the stuff. And, and uh, we're lucky because the woodchucks haven't even and made enough holes that the rabbits can just consistently hide and not come out. They've got to come out. So the rabbits are there, they're under the stumps, the deadfalls. In the raspberries that have grown up between all this stuff, they're tough to get out. I'm not saying we're gonna get every one out, but there aren't so many holes that uh, we can't get any mm -hmm. of them out. If, if we were to hunt this without dogs, Tough, tough? Tough going. Usually, you know, I think you can kill about as many rabbits or take as many rabbits uh, without a dog as you can with a dog. But this kind of hunting, you definitely need the dogs. And not to run the rabbits in a big circle. You need the dogs simply to root them out of the brush piles. Okay, now the dogs. You have your, your two beagles. Describe your beagles, Mark. I've heard so much about them that they're tops. Uh, they're, Is that true or false? That's true. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they have put a few years in on them, uh, six on one and uh, almost five on the other, and uh, they're pretty well disciplined. They do what I tell disciplined them Disciplined beagles? Yeah. Oh, this is going to no, be a I'll treat. Hold it, hold it. <laughs> <laughs> they'll they'll, they'll uh, go in where I want them to, and uh, if there's a rabbit in the brush pile, they're going to flush it out. One's a strictly a good pile dog, and the other one's a good trailing dog, and together they really make a good team. Okay, explain that, the difference between a, what you call a pile dog and a trailing dog. <clears throat> one, one dog uh, will go in there and, and rip the brush apart and won't come out at all, and the other dog kind of work around the edges until it gets too excited and smells the rabbit, and then it'll go in sometimes. Mm -hmm. But this other dog, it's used to busting the brush. It grew up with a bigger dog and had to follow it into the brush, and kind of took over that um, role when I started hunting them with Mandy, the, my dog. So is that what makes the dogs uh, different, their, their yeah. genetics? Uh, yeah, one, the one is from uh, up north around Charlevoix, Petoskey area, uh, and the other one is from southern Michigan here. Huh. And you can tell by looking at them, they're a little bit oh, different. Oh, which one's the northern dog and which yeah, one's the southern dog? Uh, well, the southern <laughs> one's got a pointed nose, the other one's oh. got a, a snub nose. I see. Go, <laughs> There's they, something to that. Yeah, they, they well, the accent, them. too, gives them away. Yeah, the <laughs> accent gives them away a little bit. Okay, but, but they bay like normal beagles. Yeah, yeah when they uh, smell a rabbit, they'll start barking right away and uh, dig and claw in these brush piles. Uh, or otherwise, if they shoot out, my dog will come around and pick it up and run that rabbit around until it comes back again. Are your dogs uh, the trailing dog? Is it a slow dog or fast dog? Uh, it's uh, medium. It depends on the day. Like today, it'd be kind of slow but steady. Why, to, why today? Today is an uh, ideal day except for the temperature, maybe. Yeah, the temperature yeah. and the wind. Uh -huh. If we didn't have the wind and the temperature so low, they could just steam them right around to you again. Uh, but with this right here, it's ideal for getting in the brush piles right mm -hmm. now. Let's take a look at our guns. 
Greg, you have the high flutin. I'd open that up there just. High flutin automatic. 20 gauge semi auto uh, Ithaca with a Looks like custom a paint job. Custom paint job, been used <laughs> in the marsh turkeys and whatever. Bob, you're using? I'm, I'm using this gun that I, uh, I bought for my uh, son before he was born. Uh, it's a good foil for the wife, you know. <laughs> I like it. It's just a short little youth model Ranger. The stock is too short for me, but for quick pointing, for rabbits and grouse. Yeah, rack the pump. pump there to show. Yeah. It's a pump gun pumping A little shower. short barrel. You can get through the brush. Mark, you're using it over and under Yeah, right. with a swivel mount. Yeah, it makes it a little bit uh, easier to carry. With a sling. Can, yeah, jump across the creek. You can put it over your shoulder instead of dropping mm -hmm. it in the creek. Yeah. And I'm going to be using my tried and true trusty 20 gauge single shot inexpensive used for my youth well broken in an excellent all right, rabbit all right, gun all right. you can't beat a hey, gun like this we'll just see how you shoot that's, okay. that's hey, you can talk all you want about a gun but till you shoot it that's right but that's the nice thing about rabbit hunting you can use a variety of guns sure can yeah 22s but out out here with a bunch of people with 22s there's always a possibility of a ricochet so shotguns are mm -hmm. well light shot are really fine for this Okay, well, it feels like a good day to me yeah. for rabbits. I'm ready. We have a spot that hasn't been hunted yet this year. <laughs> Everything, we got excellent dogs. We have a barrage of guns. Want to let the dogs out? Yeah. Uh, now we want to see these well-trained, mannerly beagles. Hey, that's no fair. Mandy, come on. Come on. <laughs> Where's the rabbit? <laughs> now, here's something you don't often see a beagle do. Get a rabbit, Ginger. Ginger. Gonna get rabbit. I'll be dog one. That beagle came back. <laughs> An obedient beagle. That's something you don't see very often. These little dogs have a reputation for getting out of their pens or out the back door, slipping away to the nearest patch of rabbit cover, and coming home only when they're dog tired. Their short little legs don't carry them very fast, and they don't seem to tire as quickly as the longer legged, faster running bird dogs. Or, as fast as the longer-legged, older, but supposedly wiser hunters that follow these beagles wherever they go. And they generally go to the rabbits. Aha, now I've spotted the first good rabbit sign here at the first brush pile. In some areas, these little pellets are thick, along with rabbit tracks going every which way. Brush piles always hold a lot of rabbits, and when I say a lot, it wouldn't be unusual to rouse 20 or 30 rabbits from a big pile this size if you could take the whole thing apart. In fact, in this cold weather early in the season, 50 or 60 rabbits in that pile wouldn't be a surprise. But you can't take the brush pile apart. So you send the beagles in to wiggle through the sticks and the twigs, crawl under the stumps, and hopefully send a couple cottontails running for another nearby brush pile. Visibility is better on top of a brush pile but getting there can be tough sometimes. These dogs worm their way through everything, it seems. Of course, this is Ginger, the pile dog who spends all of her time in the thick stuff, while Mandy patrols the borders, trying to pick up the scent of a bunny that bolted from one pile to another. All of a sudden, Mark sees a cottontail making tracks, so he shoulders his gun. Well, it was a good shot, the second one, that is. And I retrieved Mark's first rabbit of the day right. while he tried to show us a trained beagle. Here. Come on, let's go. Yeah, yeah, over here. Come on, come on, yeah. <laughs> well, on this 40 acres, there are probably hundreds of rabbits, yeah. plenty to feed the neighborhood foxes, yeah. hawks, and other predators that will eat as much as 80% of the rabbit population in a year including man, who really takes a small number of the annual crop. <laughs> what attracts many hunters back to the fields is the taste of these critters. Underneath that fur is quite a bit of meat that I suppose is close to chicken as anything. There are more rabbits moving around in this pile. It just takes a while to see them. But when they move, oftentimes all you catch is a glimpse. Greg and I posted ourselves on the side of the brush pile that faced the other piles, thinking this would be where most of the traffic would come. Now, see if you can see the rabbit moving in there. Oh, oh, oh. There goes. Oh, I can't shoot that way. If you saw it, you were quick. It takes a sharp eye, even when you're right there. Again, in slow motion, right there. 
Did you see it there? Backwards, <laughs> forwards, it's a dark flash through the branches. Here it comes again. Now let's give it a good look, only for a second. I wasn't watching then, but you can see it run back again. And there it goes. You can see how fast and fleeting cottontails are, nearly impossible to catch on tape. Did you see that one run? The whole sequence at normal speed took three seconds. Bunnies and beagles, an enjoyable way to put a tasty wild meal on the table. That's America's number one most popular game animal, the cottontail rabbit, a big winter attraction among sportsmen in Michigan outdoors. I found that any chicken recipe works well on rabbit. They're very similar in, in cooking, but Scott Soleather won our small game category last wild game cooking contest with Dijon Rabbit. Dijon Rabbit. You want to get all the fat and fell off the rabbit pieces. You want just little pieces. You can debone it, and he says you can debone it or leave it in whole pieces. It's funny. People don't think about taking that off of small no, game. No, well, you don't think it's there, but it really is. Makes it, it a lot more oh, tender. Oh, you bet. It's got onions and carrots. It sounds like a stew recipe. Dijon mustard. Oh, that I and like Dijon Italian mustard. dressing. And that's the only spices there is in there. There's no salt, which makes it real nice. And you want to marinate these in the dressing and the mustard. Ma just marinate everything. Then you're going to go ahead and fry it first, just little pieces at a time, because you want them pretty browned. You mean you're taking out the? Uh, oh, I see. You just, take just the meat. Take pieces. the meat out right. of that marinade. How long right. do you let it marinate? Oh, just until they're brown. You don't want to no, marinate. Oh, marinate. Um, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, not real long because the dressing is strong mm -hmm. and it will cook with everything. And then you're just going to go ahead and put the meat on top of the vegetables and bake it for about 35 minutes. Not very long at all. No. Here it is. Dijon Rabbit that Scott sold leather from Palmyra won our small game division. Raj McCarville, you were there, you were eating this. This is one <laughs> of them that I gave a 10 to, I believe. Is that <laughs> right? It's really good. And what about the taste of it though? This. This, another one of these recipes, believe it or not, has been in the freezer. That's right. Since the cooking contest, yes. nine months. Yes. Mm. What well, do you, you think, can't Raj? tell it. No, it tastes great. Makes me want to go out and start a rabbit farm. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, now, this freezes very well, and I think um, I think you could keep it like chicken or turkey frozen in that For quite recipe. a long time? Yes. Excellent way to cook it. Excellent way. By the way, Bob Garner isn't with us for this show. His brother was seriously ill and is in intensive care right now. Bob couldn't be with us, but we hope the best to Don and the family and everybody be back together next week. Hope so. But this is the recipe. Dijon Rabbit and Bob Garner, believe me, gave it <laughs> a 10. <laughs> the Western UP always comes up with some big bucks. Verlin Miller from Kalamazoo took this 10-pointer from Ontonagon County. It has a dollar bill taped to that tall tine on the left, Merlin wanted us to know that that tine is over a foot long. Dale Bush from Traverse City took this 11-pointer down in Tuscola County. The longest tine is 12 and 3 8 inches. That buck dressed out at 195 pounds. John Wildfong from Mancelona was excited about his buck. Took it in the northwestern lower peninsula, Antrim County, 11 points with a 19-inch spread. And here's Danny Rutherford from Ypsilanti. He likes his cottontail rabbit hunting along with his white-tailed deer hunting. From Washtenaw County, he's holding a beautiful 12-point. I've noticed over the years that we don't have too many black hunters enter our hunting awards, but last year at our Stroh's Hunting Awards banquet, Jesse showed up with a trophy that easily captured the spotlight. Jesse Rutledge from Detroit. Jesse got this in Branch County. Step up here. Jesse, this is a 14-pointer. Right. Cold one. Well, I, I hunted for two days up in northern Michigan, and they didn't have no luck. So I come home that night, and I called my buddies that didn't go with me. They had scored two big deals in the southern part, so I packed up and joined them with the shotgun. This was on the 22nd of November. Right, in Branch County. What, any other story behind this one? No, I was just, I didn't know what I was going to kill a deer that year or not, so... Uh, you were getting disappointed. Right, after up north and back down, still hadn't got one, so uh, I was on my way back out for lunch, and I met this deer right in the road. I guess he was looking at a squirrel or something. Now, next year, you're going to start the season down south or up north? I'm going to sell my rifle. Stay with my shotgun. You stay with your shotgun? Right. Okay, that worked out real good. 14-pointer for Jesse Rutledge from Detroit. 
We're still waiting for Jesse's entry for 1987, but if he didn't get a trophy this year, his 14-pointer still makes him our Michigan Outdoors Deer Hunter of the Week. Mike Rankin from Kingsville, Ontario, wanted to know why crows attack owls. He asked if a single crow will attack an owl, do they kill them if they catch them, and will crows go after hawks? Well, here's a great horned owl that swooped into a tree near my deer blind opening day, and like all owls, it's a predator. One of its favorite springtime foods is baby birds, especially baby crows it snatches from nests. That's why adult crows dive bomb owls to drive them away from the nesting areas. A single crow will attack an owl, but they always call up a storm and bring in other crows to help harass the owl. They are capable of killing an owl if they could catch him, but nobody's ever heard of this happening. Owls can't catch the crows, by the way, because crows are smaller and more maneuverable and they stay out of their way. And yes, hawks get the same treatment. Crows, by the way, eat the eggs and babies of other birds, which is why you'll often see small birds nipping at crows, the same way crows nip at hawks and owls. When we covered Michigan's elk hunt on last week's show, it was the first time we took my four-wheel drive Bronco on this expedition. In previous years, we took a van because it had so much space for people and camera equipment. The trouble was, the van couldn't go places we wanted to go. Here's a typical northern Michigan two-track road after a light snow when the temperature's above freezing. We were in four-wheel drive, and maybe we could have made it without. Maybe. Not sure. When you go through the ruts and you don't have high clearance, you can sometimes get stuck on the humps. And when you drive off the road, it's often easy to hit a soft spot. And in two-wheel drive, it doesn't take long to bury your vehicle right up to the axles. I used to be one who didn't think four-wheel drive was necessary, and it isn't, I suppose, if you want to stick to the dry, flat roads. But on the elk hunt, it was getting late, and our guide at Canada Creek Ranch wanted to take a shortcut. We needed those front wheels to help pull us through. There was the remains of an old logging trail here somewhere. No way a normal vehicle would have made it. I was in low range four wheel drive for maximum power as I threaded the bronc through the trees. Which way here? Cutting through this little 75-yard stretch of woods saved us at least 20 minutes, maybe a half hour of backtracking on territory we had already covered. So four-wheel drive is a convenience, but it's also safe. You have the power to go where you need to go in the backcountry, and you always know that you can get out. What if somebody has an emergency and you have to get into a hospital? Those are the times you panic and get stuck. So for me, four-wheel drive is a necessity, and in the future, it's going to be hauling our cameras back into places that are going to surprise you. So watch for that Bronco and four-wheel drive. We'll be roaming the backcountry of Michigan outdoors. Everybody battles the problem of cold outdoors. Ice fishermen in particular at this time of year, fingertips and toes get very cold. It happens to deer hunters, rabbit hunters, snowmobiles snowmobiler skiers. We found in our Outdoors Forever program and trying to get handicappers out on the ice and out in the winter that one of their big problems is circulation. To solve this, we studied this, talked to a John McPhail, our resident health expert. He said, of course, you can wear warm clothes. That always helps out. But one of the things you can do is get a good breakfast. Now, a perfect breakfast to stay warm. We have this in our um, Outdoors Forever supplement of the Outdoor Digest. But John, I mean, I, we've always eaten bacon and eggs and sausage and all this high energy, uh, take candy bars out on the ice. Mm -hmm. And you say, wrong? Wrong. <laughs> what you want to do, the worst thing you can do is to just take some, some coffee. you got to have energy on board to get that heat. The other thing is that if you go with the carbohydrates, that's immediately available to the body. It carbohydrates starts, means what? Okay, we're looking at waffles, pancakes, uh, oatmeal, fruits, mm -hmm. vegetables, uh, orange juice, those types of things. Not very glamorous breakfast. Not glamorous, but it stays with you, gives you that efficient energy. If you eat the steak and eggs, it starts to stay with you a lot longer. It doesn't digest, and it shunts the blood away from the extremities and the working muscles. Didn't you tell me that they did some experiment on rabbits? Right. Uh, if you eat a really fatty type of breakfast that we notice when you look at the ears of a rabbit where you can see those little tiny arteries, mm -hmm. we can actually see the blood cells start to clump up more in the ears when of the rabbit. When they were fed those... The fatty type the of... Fatty. 
What about, Rod, you're a diabetic and you have to watch it. What about well, that, candy bars? That was one of the things I got out of the magazine, the fact that you can take the oatmeal. I don't have to worry about the sugar, but I have carbohydrates to uh, stay with me. And the uh, opening day up at Jack's Landing, we ate them out of all the oatmeal they had in the hotel. Mm -hmm. But what about candy bars? Okay. Everybody says high energy. Does, does that just kind of... It's too quick? sweet. What that does is cause you to kick out a lot of insulin and then all of a sudden your blood sugar will go down. These carbohydrates are slowly absorbed and stays with you for the long haul. Ah, so what this means is to me then, if, if what you're saying is correct, stay off of those uh, steak and eggs and bacon and sausage breakfast. Go instead to oatmeal, pancakes, French toast, uh, as long as you go easy on the syrup. Easy on the syrup. Stay with the carbohydrates, avoid the candy bars and all that, and you will be able to stay warmer, longer outdoors. What an outdoors forever tip. I think all of us can benefit. Mm -hmm. According to Michigan State Police estimates, how many handguns are actively maintained by homeowners in Michigan? The state police estimate 1.9 million handguns are currently in use or kept in usable condition in the state, that averages one handgun for every two households in Michigan. I hope you can get out this weekend. I think with all the snow we have, it should be, once again, a great place to be. See you next week. There goes. Oh, I can't shoot that way. If you saw it, you were quick. It takes a sharp eye, even when you're right there. Again, in slow motion, right there. Did you see it there? backwards and forwards. It's a dark flash through the branches. Here it comes again. Now let's give it a good look, only for a second. I wasn't watching then, but you can see it run back again. And there it goes. You can see how fast and fleeting cottontails are. Nearly impossible to catch on tape. How'd you see that one run? The whole sequence at normal speed took three seconds. Bunnies and beagles, an enjoyable way to put a tasty wild meal on the table. That's America's number one most popular game animal, the cottontail rabbit, a big winter attraction among sportsmen in Michigan outdoors.